I'm going to do a quick introduction of our moderator, Lou Chabarro, Jr., has reported on LGBT civil rights movement and the LGBT community for more than 30 years, beginning as a freelance writer and later as a staff reporter and currently as senior news reporter for the Washington Blade. He has chronicled LGBT-related developments as they have touched on a wide range of social, religious, and governmental institutions, including the White House, Congress, the U.S. Supreme Court, the military, local and national law enforcement agencies, and the Catholic Church. Chabarro has reported on LGBT issues and LGBT participation in local and national elections since 1976. He's covered the AIDS epidemic since it first surfaced in the early 1980s. Please help me welcome Lou Chabarro. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, <clears throat> our two panelists this afternoon, who I'm sure are going to be presenting some interesting information. Uh, let me start off with David Johnson, to my immediate left, is an associate professor in the history department at the University of South Florida. He received his PhD in US history from Northwestern University. David's first book, the Lavender Scare, The Cold War Persecution of Gays and Lesbians in the Federal Government, which is the subject of today's panel, uh, has won three awards. Among them are the Herbert Hoover Book Award, the Randy Schultz Award for Gay Nonfiction, and the Gustavus Myers Outstanding Book Award. David, is co David co edited The U.S. Since 1945, a documentary reader which is an anthology of primary source documents for students studying American politics and culture. David has held fellowships at the National Humanities Center, the Smithsonian Institution, the Social Science Research Council, the City University of New York's Center for Gay and Lesbian Studies, and the Chicago-based Leather Archives and Museum. He currently is completing the book Vying Gay, Physique Magazines, Censorship, and the Rise of the Gay Movement, which chronicles the rise of a gay commercial network in the 1950s and 1960s. Among many other accomplishments, David is the author of numerous journal articles and book chapters on aspects of LGBT-related history in the post-World War II period. And to David's immediate left, of course, is Josh Howard, Josh Howard is a producer and broadcast executive with more than 25 years of experience in news and documentary production. He has been honored with 24 Emmy Awards, mostly for his work on CBS News, on the CBS News broadcast, 60 Minutes. Josh began his career at 60 Minutes reporting stories with correspondent Mike Wallace. He was then named senior producer of the broadcast, overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the program's 100-member staff in New York, Washington, and abroad. Josh then became executive editor, second in command to Don Hewitt, the creator and executive producer of 60 Minutes. And following that position, he served as an executive producer for the weekend edition of 60 Minutes. Josh then joined NBC Universal as Vice President of Long Form Programming for CNBC. And in that position, he created a unit that produced a series of noteworthy documentaries focusing on American business. His 90-minute film, Brother, Big Brother, Big Business, explored the ways in which corporate America works hand in hand with the government to collect information about the personal habits of private citizens. The film won an Emmy Award for Best Documentary on a Business Topic, one of three Emmy Awards that Josh earned for CNBC. And so now, uh, with that distinguished uh, background of the two, our two guests, uh, let me start, uh, David, if I could, by can you tell a little bit uh, how you got into this subject matter and uh, what prompted you to write your book, The Lavender Scare? 
Sure, uh, I'd be great to, um, glad to. Uh, it, I was a, a sort of a budding historian. I used to live in Washington, D.C. I, I had uh, gone to Georgetown as an undergrad. I was a history major. Um, I had done some graduate work, but I was doing it in, in French history. Um, I came back to Washington, and I was uh, a member of the Gay and Lesbian Activists Alliance which was a, a local organization. It was, and I think still does, tout itself as the oldest continuously active gay organization in the country. And they were celebrating their 20th anniversary. They were founded in 1971. So this was uh, in 1991. And uh, in doing that research, I got to know Frank Kameny, who was a member of GLAA uh, but had, I discovered, had founded an earlier gay rights organization in Washington. He had founded the Mattachine Society of Washington in 1961. So in doing this research for this, this other local group, I discovered uh, Frank Kameny's attic, um, <laughs> which, was quite, which was quite a thing um, at the time. Right? All of, not only, because Frank Kameny had been fired from the federal government in 1957, um, he had fought his dismissal all the way to the Supreme Court and lost. So all of his own personal papers were in the attic, but as well uh, were the papers of the Mattachine Society of Washington that he had founded. And on top of it all were the, the picket signs that members of, of Mattachine had carried in front of the White House in 1965 in one of the first uh, LGBT you know, uh, pickets, civil, uh, civil disobedience. Acts, um, and so I thought there's a you know there's a book here, and actually a dissertation first, uh, and so I reapplied to graduate school and um, turned it into a, uh, a dissertation and then and, uh, and a book. Oh, but I should say before that, as as John was pointing out, uh, it was an article first, right in uh, yeah. in the Washington History Journal. Um, I started out by doing an oral history interview with Frank Kameny and getting some local funding for that. I think I presented a paper at the DC Historical Society conference and uh, it sort of grew from there. So it started out as a, as a local history project about Washington LGBT activists and became right, something much bigger. And David, uh, what got you involved in this? Josh. Josh, <laughs> that's right, sorry. But, yes. uh, well, I read David's book. And uh, I had come across it uh, by accident. It was several years after it had been published. And I read this book, and I was just stunned by the, by the story. Uh, I thought I knew pretty much what I needed to know about the McCarthy era in the 50s and the, and the Cold War. But uh, this was brand new information to me. And uh, it just seemed like. Um, uh, there must, it seemed to me there must have been a documentary made based on this, on this material. And I tracked David down, and uh, uh, to my disappointment, he said, no, it's never been done. <laughs> and to my dismay, he said, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> and that was, uh, uh, Ju this July will be seven years <laughs> since the first time we met and discussed the idea of uh, turning this his incredible research into a into a film, uh, and it's it's we're we're finally coming down the home stretch. We're in the final stages of post production, uh, but it has been a, a long journey, and uh, it's I, we just uh, I just found it to be a fascinating story and um, one that needed to be told. Yeah. Uh, David, what is the lavender scare? I mean, that's the basis of your book. <laughs> For those who may not have read it, uh, and I, I suggest that you do if you haven't. <laughs> right, so the Lavender Scare is a fear that permeated Cold War political culture. This fear that um, gay men and lesbians uh, posed a threat to national security, that they had infiltrated the federal government and they needed to be systematically removed um, from, from government service. There was a lot, of, a lot of fear in post-war America. There was fear uh, on the international front uh, in terms of, of uh, the Cold War with the Soviet Union, a sense that 
Uh, we were falling behind the Soviet Union, that communism was sort of on the march, right? Uh, China uh, goes communist in 1949, the Soviet Union explodes an atomic bomb. Um, we seem to be falling behind. And it certainly can't be because you know, communism is a better system than uh, democratic capitalism. There, there must be another reason. There must be spies amongst us. Right? So there's a lot of anxiety about uh, communism in the Cold War. There's also a lot of anxiety after the war about uh, the state of American morality, uh, particularly after World War II, when there was a kind of anything goes mentality. People didn't know if they were going to you know, be alive the next day. Um, there's all kinds of disruptions. Uh, 16 million men right, going off to war, being uh, put into same-sex environments, uh, discovering their homosexuality in some cases. Um, so there's a lot of anxiety about American morality. Uh, Kinsey kind of corroborates that when he publishes his report in 1947 that says you know, high rates of uh, extramarital sex, premarital sex, and incredibly high rates of homosexuality. He said 37% of American men had had some form of a, of a homosexual experience. Uh, people were afraid this was the new national disease um, in the 1940s and, and 50s. So there's, there's lots of anxiety uh, in post-war America. And then you have Joseph McCarthy, <clears throat> right? a demagogue who, who, um, who uses these existing fears. Um, and most people know, or you might remember from, you know, whatever, high school history or the story of, of Joseph McCarthy's rise to power, right? He, uh, he was kind of an obscure senator from Wisconsin <clears throat> until he made his speech in Wheeling, West Virginia uh, in February 1950 that, that uh, caught national attention. It caught the media's attention because he claimed to hold in his hand a list, right, a list of 205 card-carrying communists currently working for the State Department with the knowledge of the Secretary of State. Um, and it was the specificity of that claim, which was pretty much, which was an old claim, really. Um, but what most people don't remember and what hasn't been reported in the history books is that, that those charges kept changing. First, there were 205 card-carrying communists, then there were 80 loyalty risks. Um, later, they were, they were a, a much more amorphous category of security risk. And it turned out that, in fact, two or three of the people on McCarthy's uh, alleged list were actually homosexuals who had been drummed out of the State Department. Um, and when the, the State Department uh, comments on these charges for the first time, they say, oh, no, we, you know, no communists in the State Department. Never had any, don't have any now, you know, nothing to see here, it's fine. But under very intense questioning from uh, McCarthy's Republican allies, the State Department officials reveal that, uh, well, we have fired 202 people we consider to be security risks, and among those, 91 of them are homosexuals. And this seems to corroborate McCarthy's charges, and everyone wants to know, well, why did you have 91 homosexuals? And where did they go? And are they in other agencies? It sets off this, this lavender scare, this fear that gay people had, had infiltrated the government. Yeah. And uh, let me just start off with David, uh, but Josh, you can follow up on this because I know it's part of your film. Uh, the next step seems to be, or the next major development is this executive order by President Eisenhower. And Correct. you can remind me of the number of it. Right. But, um, what impact did that have, and what exactly did it say? Is that you, for me? Uh, you yeah. can start, Josh. Sure. Uh, well, as, as David explained, there was this uh, fear suddenly in the, in the country uh, about um, you know, gays in the government, and it became a <clears throat> it became a big campaign issue in uh, in the 1952 presidential election. Uh, Eisenhower and his running mate Richard Nixon. Uh, we're running on a platform of let's clean house. And what the implication was, let's get the Democrats out of office because they've allowed all these homosexuals to uh, infiltrate the government. 
Uh, it was probably the first time that uh, politicians figured out how to use you know, family values issues uh, as, as a wedge issue. Um, in any event, uh, it was successful. Eisenhower uh, was elected in a landslide. Uh, and I think we have a clip uh, that, uh, that will, uh, will explain some of this and uh, we'll introduce a couple of the uh, other characters in the film. So if we could look at uh, that clip now. We don't need to see that. Okay, well, while we're waiting. Uh, okay. With the greatest popular vote ever given a president. Eisenhower is elected, and he immediately sets out to make good on his promise, let's clean house. One of the first things he does is sign an executive order that bans gay men and lesbians from working for the federal government. So what had been an ad hoc partisan effort led by McCarthy and his Republican allies now becomes a formal federal government policy. The federal government is actively collecting the names of anybody who shows up as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. They're saying, we will find you. Throughout my whole career, we spent a good part of our time in identifying homosexuals. We looked at every part of the person's life. It was an extensive investigation. We spoke to their current supervisors, their fellow employees, just about everyone in his whole life. You know, his minister, his church. You'd almost set up a schematic, you know, here's John here, and he's a homosexual, and he was a fraternity brother of so-and-so who was a homosexual, and he knew so-and-so, and your employee knew these people, and he socialized with these people. So you set these kind of things up, it gave you an indication that there was some kind of a connection between these people, just like a police department would investigate murders, this type of thing. They had to put little pieces together. This is what we did. You really knew something about a person. When the full field investigation was concluded, you had a pretty good picture of the person. I was born in Nashua, New Hampshire. I was raised in Melford, New Hampshire. Very, very small New England towns, extremely small. Name, Carl Rizzi, veteran U.S. Navy, honorable discharge. Employment, secretary, U.S. Post Office Department. I enjoyed it there. I was very happy there at the Postal Service. And I progressed through the ranks and through the years. And one day I was just minding my business at work and two men came in, coat and tie. I asked them if I could help them. They showed me their badges. They were postal inspectors, the dreaded postal inspector. They said they wanted to talk to me and would I come with them? Well, you know, you have no choice. Confidential informant believed subject to be a homosexual. I had been going down to this place called the Gold Key Club at North Beach. And on Sunday afternoons, they had a drag show down the center of the top of the bar. Well, for some reason, I just felt that was my calling. Confidential informant has observed the subject wearing women's clothing. They pulled out this Polaroid and they said, is this you? Well, I looked at it and I said, yes. I, I, you don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. They've got you over a barrel. And at one point, I told them that the picture they had of me was terrible, and if they wanted a picture for their files, I could bring them a decent <laughs> one. They didn't like that one bit. I, told them that. I don't know where I got the courage to say it. But they were pissing me off, and I told them. <laughs> I was so frustrated and so upset. They have their techniques and their nasty ways, and they're just so arrogant.
When I got the telephone call that said I had been selected for captain, I knew I had just been selected to hold the highest rank a woman could hold in the Navy <coughs> Reserve. After I was promoted, three women captains came to me and said, we want to try to make you the first woman admiral in the Navy Reserve. And I thought about it and I thought, but what if when I try for that, when I go for the gold ring, somebody goes looking and they find what I've been hiding all these years. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. It was too big a chance to take. <clears throat> and so I had to give up the possibility of admiral because I was gay and because I wasn't sure I could hide it well enough. I wanted it so badly and had wanted it so badly all of my life and finally got it and then found out they didn't want me. <coughs> What that uh, clip demonstrates is, uh, uh, well, not only the stories of the people who were victimized by this, but the systematic way that the government was going about identifying gay people. It wasn't, oh, here's someone who is out and you know making you know a <clears throat> excuse me a big deal about it. They were actively looking into the private lives of of um, of, of U.S. citizens, and. Uh, it was um, a very systematic effort. Yeah. Do we have any idea of the magnitude of those investigations and the firings or the forced resignations? Uh, I know David mentions in the book that we don't have an exact number, but what would you estimate? Yeah, we'll never know definitively. Um, so many people re uh, resigned, you know, quote unquote, voluntarily. Um, after an investigation like, like the one you saw in, in the clip. Um, lots of people uh, didn't apply for jobs because uh, they knew they, you know, they couldn't get one um, or, or, or for advancement, uh, like Joan Cassidy. Um, so we'll never know. But there, in some ways, the government, as it does, kept very good records about these things. Um, they were often, each agency would be asked every year, particularly the State Department, when they went before Congress, you know, how many security risks have you kicked out this year? Um, we know that the State Department alone got rid of a thousand people for uh, homosexuality. Um, and they were about 20% of the total. So I figure 5,000 is a, is a conservative estimate. And that's only for the, really the sort of the 50s and 60s period. So. Could be it could be twice that we don't know. Mm. Uh, John, what are you well, thoughts? Because in, in fact, um, this this policy went on through the '70s, '80s, and yeah. into the '90s. Uh, the um, although it was enforced uh, less as the years went by, Eisenhower's executive order was on the books until 1995, and the government was still actively, in, in those cases, denying security clearances. Uh, to people who were found um, to be gay. And uh, in fact, we have in the film the story of a um, accomplished linguist who worked for the NSA, uh, who uh, was approached one day by his uh, supervisor and said, we have information you're a homosexual and you can't work here uh, and be gay at, at the same time. Uh, and we'll, we'll tell his story, but uh, uh, it was one story in the film that has a happy ending because he, in 1980, became the first uh, 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 gay man working for the government uh, who was uh, allowed to keep his, uh, his security clearance. Uh, it didn't change the policy. The firings did continue until 1995 when 
uh, President Clinton signed an executive order um, officially wiping out uh, the Eisenhower executive order. So it went on for a very long time. And uh, one of the themes in the book as well, and I assume the film, is that most people didn't know about this. Uh, historians seem to ignore it or not write about it, according to Josh, I mean, according to uh, David in the book. And uh, yet uh, the book shows that uh, you have photos of newspaper uh, tabloids with banner headlines saying homosexuals in government in the 50s even. Was this something that was sort of uh, a secret in plain sight, as the expression goes? I'm just wondering why more people didn't uh, right. know about it right. in the later years. Right. Yeah, we have this notion that, oh, back in the 50s, right, people didn't talk about homosexuality, and it wasn't discussed. And um, Frank Kameny even said that once. He thought that was the case. But, but there were, right, as you said, there were headlines about this. This was in the paper every day in the 1950s. Um, and it encouraged people in the federal civil service to start uh, ratting out their their uh, coworkers. Uh, in fact, so yeah, it was it was talked about at the time. Um, and when I started doing, you know, serious scholarly research about about the period, and I would read, you know, books on on McCarthy, McCarthyism, and the Red Scare, and they would almost all have some reference to the Lavender Scare, some reference to the fact that you know, well, gay people were also targeted, or, or one example they would use would actually be a gay person, but they would feel no need to explain that. Right? That was just, well, of course they were firing gay people. They've always fired gay people. Um, not realizing that this, in fact, was an entirely new uh, anti-gay system uh, un, you know, at an unprecedented level. This was not just. Uh, business as usual for the federal government. What, what also wasn't clear was just how many people were, were being fired. In the late 40s, early 50s, uh, there were headlines that the government was um, uh, chasing gay people uh, out, of, out of the government. But no one really knew how systematic and how widespread this was. Uh, it, some of the people who uh, I approached, and David had earlier approached uh, uh, for interviews, uh, said that they thought they were the only ones, that they didn't realize how many other people were, were fired from the government uh, for this reason. And part of the reason we don't know the scope of it is that there was really a conspiracy of silence uh, on, both, uh, on both sides. The gay uh, people who were being fired uh, wanted, did want to remain in the closet because they wanted to get hired for other jobs. And in many cases, they weren't ready to tell their friends and. And, and, and family, uh, and so they kept it quiet, and the government at some point stopped talking about it because after all this attention about how they're firing these gay people in the, in the late 40s and early 50s, the fact that they're still firing them in the you know, <laughs> late 50s and 60s and 70s, they didn't want to talk about that because then people would say, why did you hire them in, in the first place? Uh, so there was really a... Um, as I say, a, consp a conspiracy of silence. The McCarthy era is known as the time when suspected communists were chased out of the government. And from what we know, there were probably about a thousand people who uh, were fired for being uh, 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 communist, uh, compared to the number who were chased out of the government for being gay, it, it turns out to be a really a minor part of what the McCarthy era was. But, but the interrogations of the gay men and lesbians occurred behind closed doors. Right? We have news clips of people being accused of being communists you know, in front of, uh, of congressional committees and so forth. But all of the interrogations of gay people were behind closed doors. Um, and right, it's a conspiracy of, of, of silence. And uh, what uh, relevance is this today now? We're learning these things that are coming out. Um, does it have any relevance? Should people, more people know about it now? Well, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it has a great deal of relevance uh, on a couple of different levels. Uh, I think for gay men and lesbians, the, it's, it's important to know what, um, uh, what our history is. 
Uh, it's particularly important to point out that the lavender scare happened at a time that uh, followed a period that was much more uh, hospitable to, uh, to gay people. Uh, David in his book uh, wrote about how Washington in the, in the 30s and 40s was a very open uh, uh, gay, you know, gay city and very accepting. Uh, and really what happened in the 1950s was a backlash. And it's, uh, you know, I think it's important for people to understand that. On a, on a broader level, it's, you know, it is a story about gay people, but it could really be any minority group. And I think what it illustrates is that during times of concern about national security, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to uh, you know, pick, pick a minority group and demonize them in the, uh, in the name of patriotism, which is uh, what was being done in the 1950s. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> possibly uh, as a precursor to showing the next clip, can you, each of you tell a little bit about maybe one or two examples of the individuals that uh, you talked to who uh, gave compelling stories of what happened to them in these interrogations or in the firings? Um, David, any one or two particular stories that stand out maybe? Uh, um, Madeline Tress uh, is the story that stands out to me. She was a, a young economist in the Department of, of, uh, Department of Commerce, I think. Commerce. Yeah. Um, who was called in one day. She had you know, been hired within a, within a year or so. This was in the early 50s. And like all federal civil servants, she had to go through a background check. And she gets called uh, in to see uh, two security officers, uh, you know, unannounced. They don't tell her what it's about. Uh, they start to ask her mundane questions. Uh, and then they ask her, you know, we have information that you are a homosexual. What comment do you care to make? Which was their typical line. And uh, she asked if she could have legal representation. They said, no, can't have, uh, can't have a lawyer in the room. Um, and like most people, she didn't know how to answer that. She didn't want to lie. She also didn't want to tell the truth. She didn't know which was worse. Um, I think she just refused to answer. But then they had more questions for her. Right? They had, so you know the name of so-and-so, or you know so-and-so, and mentioned some of her lesbian friends. Have you ever been to the Redskins Lounge, which was a lesbian bar in DC? She admitted that she had, but she just went because she liked the orchestra there. Um, uh, and the questioning kept going on like that. And she just gave them just enough uh, information uh, that they, you know, they, they fired her. Um, and that firing stayed with her. She, she uh, had hoped to have this great career in international affairs and international economics. And she applied for a Fulbright and won. And she was denied it because of her, uh, her government investigation. Josh. It's really an example of how uh, people at all levels of government were, were, were targeted. Uh, it, well, Frank Kameny had a PhD in, um, in astronomy. Uh, Carl Rizzi, who, who we saw, was a fairly low-level person at the, you know, at the Postal Service. So it wasn't as though there were certain peri uh, people in uh, specifically sensitive areas that were being, uh, were being targeted. This was a... Uh, this was a campaign uh, that uh, uh, permeated all levels of, of the government. Uh, another uh, uh, story that we, uh, we tell in the film involves a, um, a, a guy who is a first generation American. His parents um, uh, you know, came here to you know, raise a family. He's, he was the first guy in his family to go to college. He eventually got a job with the State Department. And um, rather than me tell it, uh, we do have a clip, and uh, it'll be much more interesting that way, I think. So if we can have the second clip.
I learned very early on that A, I had an Uncle Drew, and B, about his circumstances. When I was little, there was hushed conversations about, oh, that was your Uncle Drew. He was a fantastic, a fine, a wonderful man. I followed him around like I was his tail any time he was home. <laughs> he, told, he told me that a few times. He says, well, he says, you're acting like my tail. He says, you follow me everything I do. But uh, he spent a lot of time with me and he, he, was, he was never in a hurry to chase me away. Then Uncle Sam called and Drew went into the army. He was a medic in the military. Served his time over in uh, France. He knew five languages. He knew English, Slovak, Latin, German, and French. And so after the war, he applied to the State Department for a job in the Foreign Services. And he was off for interviews and background checks, and lo and behold, he got the job with the State Department in the Foreign Services. He would send uh, letters regularly to Mom and Dad. And they always let the whole family read the letters, you know, so everybody would know what's going on and what he had to say. Christmas in Paris turned out to be a sunny day. Our eggnog party, which we have given these past two years, was lots of fun. It was an open house arrangement, and 29 of our friends dropped in. Drew's letters exuded joy and optimism. He was very forthright about all of his friends um, and their adventures. He talked in particular about his roommate, Bob Kennerly. On New Year's Day, Bob and I drove to Avignon. I had been there during the war and was especially eager to revisit. That was one of the most enjoyable trips that Bob and I have made in France. Bob was known to the family as a minister's son. He was considered to be a very wholesome guy, and there was nothing suspicious ever. Before I close, I must include a thank you to Victor for forwarding the Christmas cards. Bob used them for decorations all around the living room. It looked very festive for the Christmas party. Happy New Year to all, Andrew. My grandparents thought that Andrew was living the American dream. They were so proud of him. He had shown that um, education and hard work and military service was all worth it. For them, the journey across the Atlantic Ocean was coming to fruition. Their dreams were, were being realized. I worked with Drew Ferentz at the American Embassy in Paris for several years and was, was friendly with him and uh, we had a small group of friends uh, within the embassy. And I, I knew his partner who was a diplomatic courier. At some point Drew told me that he thought he was under investigation, that he knew he was under investigation for his homosexuality. State Department Memorandum. Subject, Andrew Charles Ferentz. An investigation concerning homosexual tendencies was instituted. Ferentz was interviewed in Paris on August 26th and August 30th, 1954, and he admitted homosexual activities. He was quite upset about it and in turmoil. He felt it was a disgrace that he would have to tell his parents why he had left the Foreign Service and that it would be harmful to them and certainly to himself. And he uh, was just not able to cope uh, with it all. It was in September and uh, my mom took the phone call. She was out on the kitchen porch. She was out there crying her heart out, sitting on the glider there. And I, I just happened to come outside and I says, what's the matter? She says, you won't believe what I got the phone call. And she told me what happened and I just, didn't seem real.
Subject was found prostrate in his residence in Paris by his roommate, who had taken Subject to a hospital where he was pronounced dead on arrival, apparently due to poisoning by natural gas. An investigation by French police authorities reflects that death occurred by suicide from gas poisoning. I think Drew must have been in anguish. I think that he felt terror. And I think the, the breaking point were the brutal investigations that he went through. I think he must have been deeply demoralized and humiliated because of that. There was one security officer who knew that the person he interrogated committed suicide on the streets in Washington right after the interrogation. The only thing I regret uh, in my campaign to rid the State Department of that type of individual was uh, when within maybe a week and sometimes uh, minutes, they would commit a suicide. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that one guy, he barely left my office and he must have had this thing in his coat pocket and boom. Pistol. Yeah, 21st in Virginia. Shot himself right out on the street? Yeah. And of course, uh, nobody knew that he had gone in to see me. And it, and it remained a mystery, except to me and the security people. These security officers were aware of the effect their interrogations were having, but they went to great lengths to cover it up. State Department Memorandum. Subject, Andrew Charles Ferentz. Mr. Peter Zluck was already aware of the pending case regarding the subject. It is agreed the record will indicate the subject was despondent because of bad health. Mr. Zluck was specifically cautioned that no mention be made of the pending case against the subject at the time of his death. My mother loved my uncle so dearly. And even though it's 60 years later, she um, still hears those mournful, mournful taps at the funeral. She still hears the gun salute. She tells me that she remembers the two empty suitcases in the basement, symbolic of a life vacated far too early. It took a terrible toll on the family. Interesting stuff, uh, which uh, raises the issue then now, um, <clears throat> Josh, what were the reaction uh, by some of the people when you approached them to be in this film uh, so many years later? Well, uh, surprisingly, some of them did not want to appear because they were still in the closet. And I think that's an experience that uh, actually D David had before, before, before I did. Right, I mean, there were People who had become activists who you know, were easy to find and, and were happy to talk, people like Frank Kameny and, and so forth, but right, there were lots of people who were affected by it who did not want to talk to me, and I wasn't entirely sure why. But, um, and I, I would just say, so this was one of the cases of, of suicide that I uh, found documentation for, a few others, um, but I also, often saw in, in the Washington newspapers then, and there were, I think, three then in the 50s, uh, cases of you know, single men, federal government workers who committed suicide for no apparent reason. Um, and, you know, and, and I'm pretty certain right, there, there, were, there were many, many more. Um, but that was one of the ones I documented, and, and the Josh and his research team were able to uh, really flesh out and, find more information on. But the point David makes also about the, uh, the news coverage of the suicides is why it's impossible to put a number really on how many people were, were affected by this. Uh, because so many, well, in the, in the case of um, uh, Drew Ference initially, there was no, the, the family was not told um, anything about this investigation. 
and you know, then you have again the people who uh, who resigned rather than wait till they got fired, and um, it's uh, it makes it hard to tell the story um, as history for that that reason. Yeah. Uh, I, it, very soon, I think it would be nice to open it up to some questions. But before we do, let me go into the next phase of all of this uh, that's reported in the book and possibly the film. Uh, the gay community then, or the, we would say LGBT community now, but uh, didn't all of this trigger some kind of response in the early years, I guess uh, maybe in the early 60s, uh, where there was some kind of fighting back? Uh, do you want to go into that a little bit, David? Sure, and that's, and that's the, the good news uh, of, the, of the otherwise depressing story, is that it, the Lavender Scare does lead to to activism, um, first in the in the person of Frank Kameny, uh, who we mentioned, right, who who uh, fought his dismissal administratively and, and through the courts, and and he lost uh, in the late fifties. But he then decides, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue this struggle uh, on a on a collective level, and starts the Mattachine Society of Washington. Um, which was really the first, I mean, there, were, there was a Mattachine Society in California, started in 51, but it's the Washington chapter of it that really becomes a, uh, an activist organization and, and uh, starts the, the kind of standard uh, political reform efforts that, that uh, you know, have continued on ever since then. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that you mentioned uh, about uh, Frank Kameny that seemed to differentiate him from other groups at that time was that he modeled his efforts after the civil rights movements. Um, we didn't see that in some of the other earlier groups. He did. Um, and there was also something, well, uh, there's lots of, part of it was, was Frank, right? He had a PhD in astronomy. He, he was not intimidated by, um, you know, government Workers or, or uh, you know attorneys or you know he, he had a sort of uh, self confidence I think we can say um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that allowed him to to continue the struggle but there there's also something unique about um, about Washington in that this was sort of ground zero for the lavender scare right so many federal employees gay federal employees lived here were affected by it um, there was even an earlier Mattachine Society. Uh, in the 50s that also tried to be activists. Uh, it it uh, wanted to be the, the Mattachine chapter that repealed unjust laws. And the, the parent group in, in California said, no, you can't do that. Um, we're, we're an educational and research group and, and we can't really get involved in, in politics. But it shows that in Washington, even in the 50s, there was, there was a, a groundswell sort of, of, of Activism amongst uh, gay people because they were, you know, they were most at at, uh, at risk by the Lavender Scare. Frank Kameny, in particular, couldn't find another job because he was an astronomer in the 1950s, when every job involving astronomy uh, re basically required some sort of security clearance or a relationship with the government. So he was unemployable, and that's one reason he felt. Yeah, he, he, uh, he had to fight. Um, Josh, what would you say the overall message is in your film? Well, uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, uh, first of all, I just think it is important to, uh, to tell the story. You know, LGBT history tends to be uh, marginalized, and I think this is an important aspect of American history that we have to, uh, that we have to recognize. But the message is, as, as I was saying before, you know, be, be vigilant because uh, successes that we've had recently are not necessarily permanent. And just, uh, you know, we should be aware of uh, uh, the victories that we've had and uh, we still have to protect them. The other message is that, uh, you know, this, this government-sponsored homophobia uh, re really did filter down. It wasn't just the federal government. There were you know, states and localities that did their own uh, purges. Uh, and 
you know, in fact, today there is still no federal law that protects LGBT people. Uh, there, there's, there was some survey recently, 80% of the people questioned believed that federal uh, civil rights law uh, also covered uh, sexual orientation and uh, gender identity, and it, it doesn't. Uh, there are states and municipalities that have uh, their own ordinances, but in fact there are 29 states still today in which it is perfectly legal for an employer to fire an employee based, based on sexual orientation or uh, uh, gender identity. And so that's an, another message of the film is uh, there's, still, there's still work to be done. Yeah, I would agree. I'd just add that, that um, there's a kind of, I think there's a sense that, well, you know, the gay community today is, is pretty powerful um, and secure and, oh, you don't really need any sort of, you know, uh, uh, government protections or civil rights laws. Um, and that's why this, this history is important. All right, uh, final question before we open it up. Uh, to the audience, I want to just mention something and then uh, get your response to it. We talked about it a little bit before, but uh, I had the privilege, of course, and the honor to have known Frank Kameny for many years and interviewed him. Uh, he was an excellent news source. But one of the stories he had told me personally, and David touches on this in the book, is that he had a chance to turn the table, so to speak, on J. Edgar Hoover. At some point, he told me that uh, he got a call from an FBI agent on the phone. It was in the early 60s. And uh, they said, Mr. Kameny, we'd like to meet with you. And Frank told me, I, I didn't know what they were going to do. Were they going to arrest me? Well, he went to the designated place for the meeting. It was not in the FBI office, but somewhere else. And the agent said politely and a little contritely, uh, the director, Mr. Hoover, would like you to take him off your mailing list for the Mattachine Society newsletter. And uh, Frank Kameny told me, he said immediately, he said, well, I have to consult my board of directors. We'll get back to you. And ultimately, when he did get back, he set a series of conditions, among which were that the FBI would have to stop surveilling gay people and putting them on their lists. And uh, they didn't respond to that. So. <laughs> He, Hoover remained on the Mattachine Society's mailing list, possibly until his dying days, I'm not sure. But, uh, but I guess I, what I would ask you is that, is this an example of something that uh, the role that the FBI uh, played to some degree? David did say in his book, I should say, that uh, there doesn't seem to be sufficient evidence that Hoover himself was gay. Uh, that has something that has been sort of folklore but being the thorough researcher that David is, his book says he doesn't have sufficient evidence. Well, the, the rumor, the, the story that everyone knows about, you know, the allegation that he was seen wearing a negligee at the Plaza Hotel uh, comes from a mafia boss's wife who uh, went to prison or was, char or was found guilty of perjury uh, in another case, I mean, it's it's entirely incredible story. Um, I don't know what his sexuality was. He certainly didn't self-identify as a, as a gay person, and I think a lot of people tend to they bring Hoover up because they say, oh well, look, you know, even gay people were you know behind the lavender scare. It shows the the extent of the homophobia in in the 1950s. Okay, well, why don't we open it up if uh, anyone may have some questions. Uh, get a microphone to someone. Before we start with questions, just help me thank our uh, panelists, Lee Chabal, Josh Howard, and David Johnson. If you have a question, raise your hand. Katrina and I will get a microphone to you so we, we can get it on tape. On Tuesday evening, um, March 6, 1962, I became the 17th member of the Mattachine Society. At 20, I was then the only minor then involved, and I'm now the only living person 
uh, that existed in 1962. Uh, my question is, um, uh, at that time, it was the Office of Naval Intelligence who were picking up gay men and lesbians for questioning. Um, you didn't have to be working in federal government. You could be working in private enterprise and come home and find two men from the Office of Naval Intelligence wanting you to come to the Navy Yard for questioning. They were always looking for names of people who might be working in government. My question is, was it just the, the Office of Naval Intelligence, or do you have, were there other government organizations involved? Well, it was really every agency of the U.S. government. Uh, the FBI was involved. The Civil Service Commission had their own investigators. Uh, each agency uh, was within the agency looking, looking for gay people. So this was a government-wide policy that was being executed uh, by each, each agency. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, uh, Lou mentioned the incident about J. Edgar Hoover, and I was involved in that. Um, we sent out the Mattachine Review, and I believe it was in 1965 they contacted us and Robert Bellinger and Frank Kameny went down and talked to um, um, members of the FBI about our sending the Mattachine Review to J. Edgar Hoover. Okay. Uh, David, um, you and I had some contact in the 1990s when you were working on your dissertation and I served you some of the Senate executive session um, transcripts. If you were going to redo your dissertation today, knowing what you've learned in the last 20 years, how might you refocus it and what might you have changed? Lou? Wow. Um, I'm not sure I would redo it, actually. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> hmm. How would I refocus it? Well, if you refocus your dissertation, I'm going to have to refocus the <laughs> film. So let's not do that. Um, I don't. In, in some ways, it would be more difficult now because, as as we were talking about earlier, uh, a lot of people have passed away um, now that we wouldn't get to talk to, um, except for Paul Kunstler. <laughs> um, in some ways, though, it might be easier now. Um, when I went to the National Archives for the first time and asked for uh, State Department records about uh, their policies in the 50s vis-a-vis -vis, you know, gay people, the archivist at the National Archives, who was used to dealing with uh, people doing sort of regular uh, foreign policy history, diplomatic history, fairly conservative history, uh, looked at me like I was crazy. He said, you, you can't just come in here and, and look at people's personnel records. And I said, well, I wasn't interested in individual records. There were policies, there, I'm sure there were policy statements about this. This was in the newspaper all the time. Um, and just experienced a lot of hostility towards my, my project, which I don't think I would, uh, which I wouldn't today, I don't think. Um, in the book, Coming Out Under Fire, um, the author talks about how um, during World War II, the um, military set, started to fire people for being gay or started to like oust them and give them blue slips. Would you say that was at the catalyst of the Lavender Scare, or was that just part of the overall movement of the Lavender Scare? During World War II? Yeah. Or, yeah, that's where the sort of... Uh, anti-gay government policy begins in the military during World War II, but um, it starts out as a fairly um, benign policy in a way. It starts out as a liberal reform. The psychiatrists in the military don't want to have post-war psychiatric casualties, and they so they want to keep out people who are likely to become uh, such casualties, and, and of course, they considered homosexuality to be a mental illness. So they said, well, let's screen those people out, and that will help us, and it will help them. Right? Um, but the policy kind of morphs, right? And it, and it takes on different rationales. Um, 
And the, and the military was never really about national security, although the, you know, the reason kept changing. Right? It was about unit cohesion, and you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't really matter what the, what the, the official uh, reason was. But that is where the, the first sort of anti, uh, anti-gay government policy begins, yes, is the military, and kind of spreads State Department and then to the, the entire, entire government. First of all, thanks for doing the film. It really, uh, it, it's important. Uh, a couple of things. Um, I had always uh, read somewhere that uh, Jed Hoover and Clyde Tolson, they both, there's a number of pictures of them vacationing together. So that's, um, that might be a clue there. But what is, what, <laughs> <laughs> what is, and the in fact that uh, Clyde Tolson is eight uh, gravestones away from uh, J. Edgar Hoover at the uh, Congressional Cemetery. But I wanted to find out, uh, could you tell your coming out story? And then have you thought about, uh, what would a film be like about people that are still being fired um, in those 29 states? Would that be hard to do? Or is that something that you thought about? I know I just met a, uh, a lesbian working in a bar, and she told me, when her uh, the bar owner found out that she had a that she was getting married, he she uh, he, she he made it so hard for her that she had to quit. So um, that's it. Well, I mean that is uh, why we need we need uh, additional protections today. It is still it is still going on. Uh, we did have discussions about uh, do we bring the uh, the film up to the present and include. Uh, some stories about people who are being discriminated, discriminated against today. And uh, just as a filmmaking decision, we decided to just keep it focused on uh, the federal government and um, this particular executive order. Um, but uh, you're, it's, there's, there's material for another documentary there, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I came out here in our nation's capital at Georgetown. Um, went to my first Pride here in D.C. Um, uh, my first gay bar on Connecticut Avenue. What was it called? Rascals? Rascals. Rascals. Um, <laughs> well, I'm from New York, but I, I was, uh, I re recall the Lost and Found, I believe. Yes. Which was, <laughs> but other than that, uh, my story isn't particularly interesting. <laughs> But uh, that'll be the third documentary, conceivably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I also should say, so I, was, I came out in, in, uh, at Georgetown, and I was thinking about the Foreign Service at the time. I took the Foreign Service exam, which I passed. Um, but I decided not to pursue it, partly because I knew the government, particularly the State Department, even in the, in the 80s, or maybe particularly in the 80s, uh, during the Reagan administration was you know, was homophobic, and so I didn't go that route. First, I want to say that uh, I greatly have appreciation for uh, Josh and David and um, Lou. For years, I have read what you've had to say in the Blade. I'm, I'll soon be 74, so I've watched you for a long time, <laughs> and I'm most appreciative for what you've said. Thank you. I'm curious over through the same years, the 50s, how they were able to keep under wraps the uh, private lives of people like Montgomery Clift and James Dean and Rock Hudson and Randolph Scott. That never came out much. Uh, and I'm curious if you're ever going to do anything about uh, Hollywood and how they keep it under. And I also, if I remember correctly, Clyde Tolson lived on Jocelyn, Hoover lived on Jennifer Street, and they both ate lunch at the Mayflower Hotel every day. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes back to Hoover. <laughs> and now the restaurant, the restaurant in the Mayflower Hotel is called the Edgar. Oh, are we gonna are we gonna do Hollywood? Uh, are we? We'll have to. Well, <laughs> now that's the fourth documentary that we have to work on. I, it was just you know it was a different time period. The press didn't report on 
on, on certain things. Uh, and not just in terms of gay issues, but uh, you know, these days, you know, anything is, uh, there's nothing off limits. And um, uh, it was just, it was a different time. And of course there are actors who, uh, you know, got, were involved in sham marriages and took other steps to uh, keep their identity secret. And uh, everyone kind of, uh, everyone played along. It turns out Liberace was gay. Well, that's not true that they, nothing came out. I mean, Hollywood studios would sort of play them off each other. Uh, when one would be threatened to be outed, um, they would give Confidential Magazine or whoever it was a, a lesser star uh, to talk about. Right? They would use them as bargaining chips. And that happened in Washington, too. Um, what is it? Uh, during the 52 election, uh, McCarthy threatened to talk about Adlai Stevenson, or basically out Adlai Stevenson. He was a divorced man. He was kind of, he was considered an egghead. He had a fruity voice, they said. Um, there were rumors that he had been arrested on a morals charge, which is probably not true, but, um, and McCarthy was gonna talk about that, but he did not because uh, the Eisenhower, or the, uh, the, uh, the Adlai Stevenson folks would threaten to bring out that Eisenhower had had an affair with uh, Case Summer, what was her name? Summers, Summersby uh, during the war and threatened to, to divorce Nanny. So it's a little blackmail going on. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you again for the film and the book and inviting us and hosting this event. Uh, my question is particularly regarding how you would like to use our your art and your voice as a platform so that the next generation of professionals, especially those who are in politics or policy studies and things of that nature, can be good stewards of progress. Um, I do a lot of work in diversity research and knowing information is half of the challenge, but so I wanted to know if you had any intention to have some type of, I don't know, <coughs> bigger platform to make sure that you're impacting the future workforce. Well, in terms of, you know, on the on educational level, uh, you know, David's book is now being used in more than 100 colleges and universities uh, in LGBT classes. And uh, we'd love the film to be a, a companion uh, to that. Uh, in, you know, in localized efforts to pass anti-discrimination ordinances, we would, uh, uh, you know, be thrilled if the film was, was used in, in those settings also. Uh, we will be doing a shorter version uh, and creating various study guides and materials to uh, uh, make it easier for, uh, for schools particularly and also organizations to use the film to just raise consciousness about the issue of job discrimination. We're just beginning. This is actually our first uh, road show. So. <laughs> it is. Get bigger, but, uh, bigger than this is the question. <laughs> Uh, I had some dear friends that uh, they died when they were about 90 years old and they were friend, uh, friends for 60 years, neighbors and all that. They worked at the uh, US Capitol for the architect and one day they were invited to a party um, at J. Edgar Hoover's to play cards and they were vetted by the FBI and when they arrived they were greeted at the door by security and they came in and J. Edgar Hoover was sitting on the couch talking to friends wearing a dress. And uh, they're not the kind of guys who would lie. <clears throat> but I was a victim also of uh, um, lavender scare. I was discharged in the military back in 1980. I was an air traffic controller. And the following year, Reagan fired all the air traffic controllers who had gone on strike. And despite the fact that they, and I applied and I, they hired me and I couldn't get the security clearance renewed, despite the fact that they needed air traffic controllers at the time. So the government was still doing things to in their own, you know, not self-best interest. So thank you uh, for coming. And uh, I'm really interested in these investigators themselves and wondered if you had opportunity to interview them and um, if, if any of those 
I, I, I can. S I, I wonder if any of those people happen to be gay themselves and uh, may have been investigated as well. So. I'm sorry, if any of the investigators... Well, if the investigators themselves, if later they have come out or in fact you have evidence of them being gay themselves... So yeah, no, we never came across that. Uh, we did interview, uh, we were able to track down a couple of people who were uh, fairly high up in the, uh, in the government. Uh, the guy who was in this, uh, the first uh, clip was the head of security for NASA uh, and he was... Uh, as, he, as he described, he spent a good deal of his time investigating homosexuals. Uh, we uh, also interviewed the guy who was the number three person in the State Department uh, in the 50s who was responsible for really instituting the, uh, uh, the policy within the State Department and executing it. Um, I met his second wife, I don't think he's gay, uh, but it was particularly interesting to, uh, to, to speak to the people who were, who were behind this. And, you know, in a way, the stories of the victims are, you know, somewhat um, uh, predictable. Uh, but to hear these government officials all these years later, uh, and, you know, with, uh, uh, with their you know, benefit of hindsight, uh, talk about what they did back then was... Uh, uh, I did think particularly interesting. This uh, um, uh, Bartley Fugler, who was in this uh, uh, in this clip, um, as I think you could see from that, uh, he's, he's that brief appearance he appears several times in the uh, in the movie. Uh, he's pretty proud of what he did uh, back then, and uh, yeah, he acknowledges that times have changed, but uh, he'd do it again, and uh, thought that was uh, enlightening. Could there be any? Uh anything taken from what I have heard from some people in the earlier years that when I started as a reporter about what they were asked during their interrogations, uh, many have said, and I think Frank Kameny has also said that they were asked by the investigators for intimate details about their sex life, including the positions for sexual activity and who was the dominant and the passive person. Could we take away anything by that from the investigators? David? <laughs> They did seem to have a Prurian interest uh, in, uh, in what went on. I'm not, I don't know what to make of that. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know, they wanted evidence? They wanted lots of evidence? Um, earlier on in the, uh, the 40s, there was a, a pervert elimination campaign at Lafayette Park run by the National Park Service. Um, and they, Paul did lots of people ask them very specific questions, and I think they were trying to figure out, well, is this person a, a habitual homosexual? Are they, are they just starting out? Can they be reformed, right? If we send them to a psychiatrist, can that, will that help them? Um, but, I don't know. Uh, this is not really a question, it's an experience I had. I was in the uh, Army Counterintelligence Corps back in the late 50s, and, um, one of our units, uh, their, their entire job was to seek out and expose um, gay people, gay men in the service. And there were heavy security risks, at least they convinced us of that, uh, because they were, would be subject to blackmail by, it was, you know, it was in, in the heavy Cold War era, so they'd be subject to blackmail by Soviet agents and you know, reveal secrets and so forth. And, um, I thought it was kind of ridiculous that I wasn't actually in the unit, but they would actually have listening devices in suspects' apartments, mm -hmm. and they would um, sit around in their in their their unmarked U.S. Army vehicles all night, just listening in. So it's not really a question; it's just an, an example of what, of what you're talking about. And everybody was convinced that they were real security risks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, it was. The, the surveillance was kind of relentless, yeah. And all, right, based on, as you said, this idea that they could be blackmailed into revealing state secrets, about which there was not a single shred of evidence, um, right? There was a big congressional hearing in the summer of 1950. They spent months interviewing people about this, uh, naval intelligence, military intelligence, police officers, and everybody said, oh yeah, gay people are you know, vulnerable to blackmail 
therefore they're a threat to national security. But when they asked for evidence about this, there was none. Not a, not a single person. Right? Even if there had been one, would that have been enough right, to base a whole government policy on? Right? No, but there wasn't, not a single one. But the fact that this notion that gay people couldn't be trusted became cemented in the, in the minds of, uh, of, you know, of, of people, of, of society. And uh, it just created this negative image of, uh, of gay people that, um, uh, that persisted. In the 1970s, um, uh, some official of the NFL was asked if there were any gay football players. And his answer was, well, there couldn't be any gay football players. But we'd, we, if we found one, we would have to get rid of him because it's been proven that they're a security risk because they've been blackmailed by um, foreign governments. And it was just an, it's an example of how this policy of the government uh, it created this persistent uh, uh, atmosphere of homophobia. Uh, yes, Garcia, I just have one quick question about how you've seen, considering the strides that we've made and how open we are now, through your time investigating this and researching this, have, how would you describe the evolution of the openness of the different agencies to give you information and to give you documents? Hmm. Um, hmm. I don't know, it's changed. Uh, it's still, I mean, you, in many cases, you still have to do a Freedom of Information Act. I had Freedom of Information Act's FO, uh, FOIA request that uh, took over a decade to be answered. Um, I don't think that's about homophobia. It's just about, the, you know, it's the, it's the way the government works. Um, I don't know. Well, in I, I, I can't really answer the question in terms of uh, research, but uh, you know, a great example is that um, you know, just about every, probably every government agency now has uh, a LGBT group, and uh, you know, back then the group was people who were fired. So there obviously has been a, you know a great deal of change of you know on that on that attitude. Terrific, thank you. I do want to follow up uh, some practical questions. David, I know your book is available on Amazon.com. We had hoped to have some, have some issues here for you to sign, but we were not able to get those soon enough. Uh, if you do buy them on Amazon, I encourage you to use Amazon Smile and plug in the Historical Society as a benefactor. <laughs> I would be remiss not to do that. And uh, Josh, if you could update us on uh, how long it took you to make the movie and where we are in the final release. Well, it's taken almost uh, seven years of uh, working on and off. Uh, uh, we're now in the final stages of post-production and uh, looking forward to some kind of distribution in the fall. So stay tuned. Thank you, guys. Before you go, and, and in conclusion, uh, there were a couple of points that were made, uh, one of which is uh, a lot of the people whose stories were collected are no longer with us, and I just want to mention that Rainbow History Project, I know, is working on an oral history project. On a bigger level, sort of at 50,000 uh, feet above sea level, the Historical Society is partnering with the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C., and there is currently some money that is being allocated to begin a citywide oral history project that will help to organize all of the oral histories and create a platform where they can be found and put into a database where they will be useful to um, researchers like David. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. I also want to mention, before we go, uh, if you're not a member of the Historical Society, we are the organization that helped put this panel together. Thanks much to David's uh, article that was published 20 years ago. Outside the door, you'll find a membership brochure. We encourage you to join us. If you'd like to see a copy of the article, we do have some uh, photocopies, and we also have the original, we have a few copies left of the original Washington history available outside. If you do sign up for membership, we'll give you the, the most recent issue of Washington history, which is a beautiful example. Our managing editor is in the back corner, Jane. Thank you. And without anything else, I thank you all for coming out today. This will be available on YouTube for, for future reference. This is a recording of the 
museum. It will be on their channel. We'll also put, plug it in on the Historical Society's YouTube channel. Give me one more round of applause for our panelists. Thank you guys so much.